The Feed. Is podcast episode artwork worth having? The importance of podcast episode numbering and an update on how Apple Podcast handles episode numbers. Apple improving podcast discovery, and it has to do with subcategories and charts. The addition of a new tab for languages, microphone shipping process to your guests, what chapter marks are good for, commentary on Spotify, Harry and Megan, and celebrity podcasts, and of course, geographic and user agent stats. Hello, I'm Elsie Escobar, Director of Community and Content for Libsyn, and this is Episode 246 of The Feed, the official Libsyn podcast, the podcast that takes it beyond how to podcast into keeping you podcasting with podcasting tips and information for the everyday podcaster and taking you inside Libsyn. Now, this show is fueled by audience feedback. So in case you are new here, I want to give you the what's what on how to be featured on the show. All right. So the number one way, send in your 30 to 60-ish second podcast promo, attach it to an email and send it over to the feed at Libsyn.com. If you don't have a promo for your show, but you do want your voice on the show, ask us a question or add to the conversation that you hear on an episode, send us voice feedback. We love it so much. You will hear excellent examples of both of those things in this episode. You can call us over at 412-573-1934. It's kind of like leaving a voicemail like, you know, back in the day when you did things like that. You can totally do that with that number. Or you can use SpeakPipe over at speakpipe.com slash the feed. Now, all of the promos and the feedback are really there as a first come, first serve. So the sooner you get that stuff into me, the sooner you'll get in the queue and we'll start to add it to our show notes. And now on to our main conversation with Rob Walsh, VP of Podcaster Relations at Libsyn, as well as my co-host, right after the first promo of the episode. This is The Why in History. Hello, wonderful listeners. Welcome to the Why in History. I'm your host, Ajay Kaul, a world traveler, blogger, and a history buff. On this program, we will talk about history, but from a slightly different angle. The study of history from the perspective of the where, when, and the how is fascinating. But it takes on a different turn when you start exploring the why. Why did certain events happen? when they did. And as we dive deep into these events and start analyzing, we'll begin to see some patterns emerge. Patterns like the smaller nations finding it difficult to survive if the bigger ones see a strategic interest. Or the fate of a nation resting solely on the whims of one individual. Intriguing, isn't it? So here is to a wonderful engagement as we go through time and analyze history. Happy listening. Hello, Rob. Good generic time of the day, Elsie. Oh, ha, 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 yes. Generically earlier. Earlier than we normally do on a week where you are just, you have got to be exhausted. Yes, I'm a little bit exhausted. And it's been nonstop raining. So it's every time I look out the window, there's never been a change. It's just raining and cloudy and dark. <laughs> We're like, this is day number four. <laughs> I'm like, where's the sunshine? <laughs> yeah, we just had that weather that you're having. We had it come through here and it was rainy and rainy and rainy for multiple days. And today I have to uh, cut out an hour early and mow my yard because my yard is starting to look like the yard where the neighbors go, when is he going to mow his yard? Oh, no, I know. Yeah, right. Don't they need, do, are there um, uh, yard cutters? I don't even like lawnmowers that are sort of like, you know, those little vacuum robot cleaners, <laughs> like, like vacuum cleaners, a little robot vacuum cleaner. But, but, but even though it's been raining so much, I didn't want to get out there oh, and rip, yeah. rip the yard up. So I had to wait. This is true. Yeah. 
Well, I'm glad that you're going to be able to do that. But now on to the show. Here we go with our first little thing. I just want to share a little bit of feedback that we got on the feed newsletter. If you didn't know, there is a newsletter for the feed, the official Lips and Podcast. I send it out in the off week. So we record one week, it goes live. And then the following week, I send a little newsletter. It's super easy to digest. I tend to write a paragraph maybe two paragraphs at the top, real quick read. And then at the bottom, it's really a copy and paste of our show notes with all of the reference links, with all of the bullet points and ways to subscribe in case you don't or follow the show in case you don't already. So I got a little bit of feedback because I asked for it. So this newsletter isn't just about a reminder for me to start working on the show notes for for (laughs) next episode. This is actually for other people. (laughs) Oh, okay. I know, right? It serves as a a reminder. Actually, you know what? I think it serves as a reminder for people too that they might have missed listening to an episode, right? And then then, then the newsletter comes out and then you go, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot to listen to the last episode of the... Like, that's great, right? That's a good thing. Anyway, it could be a reminder, but I got this little bit of uh, feedback. Here we go. Quote, I usually listen within a day or so of the episode coming out. In the past, I haven't always read this newsletter if I already listened. However, a few weeks ago, you mentioned somewhere, maybe even here, about your personal intro before the show notes, and I've read every one since then. Perhaps you should mention that on the show and maybe on the She Podcast podcast, (laughs) although that may maybe is where I heard it. I love your snippets and insights you share now that I read them, end quote. Yay. And I think, I believe that's from Cheryl. Um, thank you so much, Cheryl. I love listening to that, but because again, it's a real short hit of information insight that I'm having at the moment when I share that in, it's not anything heavy. It's not, you know, it's kind of a little bit on the lighthearted nature of it, but, um, yeah, so I, there will be a link. There is always a link in the show notes of how to subscribe to the newsletter. And that's a great way for you to have direct access to me and to Rob because I'm Rob by proxy. (laughs) (laughs) So you can always email or reply to the email newsletter and comment on episodes uh, just from reading it. So, all right, moving on to another email. Hey, Elsie and Rob, loving the feed. It's my go-to show for podcasting news. I've been with Lipson since I started podcasting in 2009 and never had any regrets. It's a great host. Yay. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Question. I recently got an email from Apple saying that episode artwork will be available in iOS 17. I get the importance of artwork, but how important is it to spend the extra time creating episode specific artwork? Thanks, guys. And this is from Tim. Okay. So, Tim, first, let's read an email Apple sent to Lipson about episode artwork that they wanted us to share with podcasters. So, um, I'll read here, quote, I'm writing to share how episode art appears in Apple Podcasts app and provide some best practices to share with podcasters when provided episode art appears on. By the way, this is per iOS 17, right? Episode pages displayed front and center and with show art displayed underneath it. On the show pages, it's displayed alongside the title and description for each episode. Under Now Playing, it appears as the main art with show art displayed in a new section underneath it. On the lock screen, the episode artwork is displayed in the media control section. Tap to expand the art to full screen. In Control Center, push Control Center to access detailed media controls, including a podcast art. Under Listen Now features an all-new design for Up Next when an episode includes episode artwork. That episode art fills the card and the show art is overlaid in the bottom left to provide additional context. So you're showing both the episode and the show level artwork in that case, so, which is why you want to have custom artwork for each episode. And then links. When a link to a podcast episode is shared, that link preview will display the episode artwork. 
There are some areas where episode art is not displayed. For example, when multiple episodes from different shows are presented together, show art is used so that users have a better understanding where these episodes came from. This experience will be common on Browse, where our editorial team features episodes from several shows as well as top charts and search. For podcasters producing episode art, here are a few tips to make it look great on Apple Podcasts. Episode art is sometimes displayed at a small size. Don't make the art too complex or include words that cannot be read at the small size. In other words, folks, shrink your artwork down to about 50 by 50 pixels and take a look at that. If you can't read what's there at 50 by 50 pixels, then you need to rethink about the text you have on there. Don't put worn piece on your artwork. Very limited amount of text. Art can be a shortcut to identifying the episode that a user wants to listen to in uh, next in a list. Guest faces help create a quick connection. Episode numbers can also help listeners quickly scan when they know specifically where they want to start. Look at the feed podcast as a great example of this. Okay, okay maybe I embellished that part. Art can be cropped, blurred, or have other elements overlaid. Use the safe zones provided in the template to make sure critical information is not obscured. In other words, remember the bottom 15% can be over, things can go over the bottom 15%. Avoid duplicating your art across all episodes. Not having episode art is better than having the same image across all episodes, unquote. So that's from Apple. So I want to thank Apple for that info. Now, Tim, back to your question. Remember, Apple Podcasts represents well over 50% of all podcasts' consumption. So yes, episode artwork is very important, starting with iOS 17. That said, we've been highly recommending episode artwork for a long time. Other reasons for episode artwork for each episode is YouTube. If you are using our feature to publish to YouTube, if you have custom episode artwork, when you, we create that video for you, for YouTube, it looks much better for your playlist on YouTube when each thumbnail is unique per each episode. Amazon Music is another reason for custom artwork. It has always done a great, great job showing episode artwork. And then there are other apps out there that do a good job with episode artwork. But Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Amazon Music, if you want your show to look the best on those little platforms, then make sure you have unique artwork for each episode. Thoughts? Any yeah. additional comments? I mean, I think that one of the questions that he has there that he said, is it worth the time, right? So extra time creating episode specific artwork. And I can tell you that the biggest investment in putting episode artwork out there is the initial iteration of what it's going to be for your show, right? So there are best practices to make sure that you don't waste your time or that it takes too long and, and adds more to getting an episode out. So one of the things that you need to pay attention to is maybe using a tool like Canva, which is where we, for the feed, have the episode artwork. And in Canva, you can create templates very easily. Um, there are some templates already that exist for podcasts, meaning you don't have to really pay attention too much to the specs, but I will tell you when you do have to pay attention to them. So go inside of Canva and create three templates for your episode artwork. So if you have an, an interview show, it's really lovely to be able to just drag and drop people's headshots maybe in there, have an area where you have maybe the title of your episode in really nice, big, bold text, like the bigger the text, the better. You might even amend possibly maybe some of the text if you have longer titles or something along those lines. You can make it really simple if it is an interview show and just have the face uh, like literally just the headshot of the person with your branding around it very subtly. That also helps very much to be able to do something like that. If you have in a co-hosted show or a solo show, maybe the leading topic of what you're putting in there, the way that we have ours is Rob and I have taken some photos in the past and we have different pictures of us together. And that's the key, having 
a little bit of a variance between one and the other. And the, that's the reason I say three, because you can change the background color to just have that subtle difference change. Uh, maybe it's you by yourself and you're trying to, and you're using your headshot, which great, fine, sure, <laughs> do that. <laughs> but have it be different so that it's three different pictures of you if, if that's what you're doing. And if you don't want to use any headshots or any people faces, even if it's just the title of the episode in nice, big, readable font, it's fine. Change the color pattern of that. That brand matches your branding. Okay, so that's re a really easy way to do it because as soon as you're finished, go inside of Canva, really quickly update to the latest and greatest of what you have. And then when you export, and this is where you have to just pay attention, when you export from Canva, just make sure that you choose JPEG and you make it a little bit less in quote quality. There's like a little uh, knobby thing that you move to like highest quality all the way to lowest quality. I would say you put it in below the 50% and that shrinks down the size of the file when you export it because remember your artwork needs to be under 500 kilobytes and you can actually see the export size like an estimated export size within Canva too if you just bring it down export that puppy out put it into your uh, platforms and whatnot and you'll be set and then you can also use that uh, episode artwork to market it in other places like we use it in our newsletter, right? So we put that in the newsletter as well. You can definitely see the cover of that. It's easy for your audience to quickly look at your go and go, oh yeah, I have to listen to that episode. They'll go inside of the podcast app and then they're going to be able to see, oh, this is the one that I saw on social. This is the one that they sent in the newsletter. They're able to pick it. So those are some reasons why and and a little bit of workflow. You don't have to use Canva. I have found that to be the most helpful for me. But if as long as you use a template that you can easily just drag and drop elements or update elements within your set, it's not going to take very long at all. And you can just upload it towards um, in the episode uh, as easy as you can it's really not that big of a deal. So I hope that that's helpful to you and it answers questions. If anybody else has any other questions, please send them over. And also, we integrate with Canva. Crazy, right? Right within the Lips and Vibe interface. I'm actually going to drop a link in our show notes for a video that we have. We have a YouTube video on this topic. So what you're saying is if you set this all up, and because we integrate with Canva, for Tim, it's almost like no extra time. Almost. There are some caveats to that integration. But again, you've got to understand the use of templates. And that's really key here. So that, And if you don't care about templates and you really just want to create something different every single time, then this is actually the best. Like the Canva integration is fantastic. Then you can just do it and then come up with something real quick. The specs are there and boom, you're done. And it's, and it's super, I know Rob for your show for today in iOS, when you were doing that, you were adding, you know, when other people were right. sending you, right. you know, episode artwork, if you will, you would feature that. And it was super different. Like every artwork wasn't created by you, it was created by your audience. So it looked very different. So there's nothing wrong with also having something not look absolutely 100% branded. It really just depends on what you are using it and how much you care about that and play around as long as the specs stay right, right? So it doesn't matter what it looks like, really, <laughs> as long as you're happy and it's working for you. But the specs do need to be on point. I have a feeling so we're going to be saying in future episodes, go back to episode 246. Because I think I have a feeling this question is going to come up more and more as we get to iOS 17, especially when iOS 17 comes out. We're going to okay, go back to episode 246 and listen to us talk about the importance of artwork. So, Tim, thank yeah. you for the question. And, and Apple, thank you for the information about why it's going to be important. And, you know, speaking about episode numbers, we had this one come up a couple of episodes ago and, and a few episodes ago now. And, and I wanted to wait until after iOS 17 was announced and I talked to Apple. So if you're with Apple, you may want to skip ahead about 10, 15 minutes into the episode so you don't hear what I'm about to say. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> so uh, okay. can you you read the, 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 the email and I will give my response here. Okay. So here's the email quote. Hi, Rob. 
One, I'm getting complaints from listeners that the Apple Podcast app no longer shows episode numbers. Below is how I usually set up the show. I understand that I need to get the number into the Apple Podcast title slot. Is there a way to automate this change? Unquote. Because you can't see what he had, but you know he was putting the episode number in the episode field. But anyway, it looks like Apple changed how things work. And I did confirm this. Um, if your show is set up as episodic, which roughly 95% of shows are set up as episodic, episode numbers no longer show up in most places in Apple podcasts. So let me repeat that. If your show is episodic, episode numbers no longer show up in most places in Apple podcasts. And that's not changing in iOS 17. That is a change that was made in iOS 16. And that's going to continue on to iOS 17, I am told. It is only shows for serial shows where the episode numbers show up everywhere. This is a problem for shows like ours and many, many others that reference episode numbers. I know Apple will say that episode numbers in the artwork is going to be there and, and you, know, you can put it there in iOS 17 and you should put the episode number in the artwork. Yeah, I agree with that, but that does not help for those that are sight impaired. By putting the episode number in your episode your Apple episode title, not just the main title, but your Apple episode title, right at the beginning of the title, it makes it easier for those that are sight impaired to find the right episode when they're using voiceover. It's that simple. And that's why I highly recommend it. And I know Apple is not recommending this, but for sight impaired users, it is paramount that you put the episode numbers in the Apple episode title. Again, Apple is not recommending you do this, but I personally am. I also recommend you keep adding in the episode number in the episode number field. So basically, you are putting the episode number in the main episode title, in the Apple podcast title, and also the episode number field. Hopefully in the future, Apple will change their decision to not include the episode number for the episode episodic show. So what you're actually not putting in the Apple episode title now is the show something like reference i used to do like tii-183 tii-184 tii-185 now i would just do 183 184 185 i won't put the tii in the beginning of the apple podcast title because that is shown in the lists now back to the question from the person there is no way to automate the change you can go into the Lipson for UI, click on content for that show, and then select Apple Podcast Tag Bulk Editor on the left. And at least there in one screen, you can go into and have access to multiple episodes at once and make the change to each episode's Apple Podcast title without having to open up each episode. So that's the, the easy way to do that. It will save a lot of time doing this in the Lipson 4 UI. Sadly, there's no bulk change to the Apple's tags yet in Lipson 5 UI that I'm aware of. Maybe there is, but I didn't find it. And I do eat my dog food uh, for the feed. I went through last night and I added in the episode number for all episodes for the Apple episode title, putting in the number followed by a colon. You can see how it looks for the feed on Apple Podcasts now. And for 245 episodes, I was able to change them all between the 10th and the 12th pick in the NBA draft last night. So I had that on last night and I started and when they just announced the 10th pick and I finished right uh, before they announced the 12th pick, which meant <laughs> I was able to fully see Grady Dick's red sequin jacket. He was 13th pick, which was an homage to Dorothy being that he played from Kansas. So when it first came out, I was like, what are you wearing? Grady, I get yep. it. Yep. So anyway, if you haven't seen the jacket, you have to just Google Grady Dick's red sequin jacket. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, there's, there's your episode title. The podcaster had a second question. Do you want to read this? Yes. Here's the second question. Quote, two, I must be doing something wrong in regards to custom permalink URL. I find myself having to open an old episode so I can copy its link. Then I'm pasting it in the new episode and changing the episode number in the URL. This can't be the best, the best way. Can it? Regards NR, unquote. So I would ask why are you even doing a custom permalink URL? 
if you do not want to mess with that, change your episode default to just use the blog page URL. You find that option in the L4 UI under settings, then episode defaults. In the L5 UI, it's under settings, then episode. Then in both, change permalink points to blog page and click save. So yeah, I would. So the issue he's having is just a setup uh, and the default settings, and he just needs to change that to point to blog page, and that will fix that issue. And I sent him that information, so he should be all good. I have a uh, just a really quick comment in terms of the episode numbers not being in the title, kind of a thing. I understand the clean nature of not wanting to see numbers out there and all of that stuff. And I understand also the power of titles for shows to be able to refer back to an episode that was covering whatever, right? Um, Especially if it's happening right now. But I know that for me, I have, as a consumer, as a podcast listener, and I am not sight impaired, I, I have, you know, my eyes are tired and old, <laughs> but but I can still see things, thank God. I can tell you that there's many times when if, if a podcaster says, refer to episode 300, or we are on episode 500, or we covered this on episode 187, it is so easy to find the episode when they mention it by opening up any app and seeing those numbers there, particularly now that a lot of podcast apps, you are able to search. If you go to the landing page, if you will, or like the the podcast page within a podcast app, there are a lot of podcast apps that now have a little search field at the top. So if you want to do a quick search on episode, you know, 150, you can just type it in that little search and then boom, it pops up for that list and you can immediately listen to that podcast episode. And it is an amazing way to be able to share with your audience if you want a quick reference, because I can tell you right now, like I have no idea what the name of the episode was when we covered X, Y, Z, Rob. But I can definitely think like, I think it was, we can definitely say, oh, we started uh, around episode 220 something or 230 something this year, head to the 30s, you know, to the 230 section. It's like, that's around where we do it, right? Because the other only other way to reference older content would be to look at dates and say like the episode was released at the end of December. And then you have to like scroll back (laughs) and look at the stuff. And I actually did an Easter egg in the last episode when we were talking about the whole Gimlet thing. I said, go look at the Ma episode, but I didn't give the episode number. It was episode 138. Now that I've Mm. updated the episode numbers, it's really easy for you to go find episode 138. But go ahead and look through 245 episodes and try to find the meh episode in the title. You'd be scrolling and looking and looking and what a pain in the butt that was. And I did that on purpose to prove a point that when I go now and I say, go find episode 138, a lot easier. Much, much much easier. easier. Yep. And even for us to be able to quickly let you guys know that. So I do feel that there's a lot of power to being able to quickly see the number. I understand the UI choices for the podcast app and the layout and making things beautiful, aesthetically pleasing and all of that. But sometimes you have to trump that for usability and to make sure that people can actually use your podcast app by searching for whatever within that context, or to look at a list of episodes and go, I want to go back to episode 100. I want to listen to episode 56. And a lot of folks actually do that. Some, and especially if you are covering TV shows, uh, rewatches, uh, all of that kind of stuff, sometimes the numbers are essential for you to be able to, to be able to do that. You know, we were covering The Mandalorian on episodes, you know, from episode 50 to episode 100. And you can just say that and mm-hmm. people can go back and look at that stuff, right? So the repetitive nature of a lot of this stuff is actually really important especially when you're covering something through a series of episodes in your show, but you're not a serial type show or seasonal type show. Just go look at the feed in Apple podcast. It looks so clean right now. And again, it cleaned it up. It looks so clean scrolling through with the numbers right at the beginning with the colon. It's consistent. It's every episode. 
And I don't know how anyone could say that doesn't look anything but good. In my opinion, again, it's what I'm recommending. I'm hoping someone inside Apple who listens to the segment will take the segment and use this as fodder to bring back the episode numbers for episodic content. But in the meantime, since they don't and it doesn't work that way today, you have to go and do a bulk change inside Apple Podcast titles to put your episode numbers in there. Sorry, that's that's just the way it is. I recommend you do that. Again, Apple does not. And that's just going to be a choice that you as a podcaster have to make for your audience. But all I have to say is do this. Turn on voiceover, put the phone under the desk where you can't see it, and then try to find an episode by number. You'll see what ha- how people that are sight impaired, ha- what they have to deal with and how much better it is to find an episode by number when you go through the feed versus, say, a podcast that doesn't have episode numbers in there and those titles. I have one last comment and just to call this out as well, for many episodes of the feed, you're going to hear us say kind of the opposite of what we're saying right now, because Apple did request and we're very adamant for us to educate you all who listen to remove the episode number from your title, from your title title, excuse me, from the Apple podcast title because of whatever reasons. They didn't want you to put it on there. They wanted you to put it inside of the episode number field, which is still there. But um, and then we were told that that episode number field is going to populate inside of the podcast app. And hence, we followed what they offered. And so this is a little bit different than what we've been saying prior per Apple's request. Well, that's because they changed how it worked. Correct. And so they have changed how it worked. Personally, at least for myself, I always try to say, this is what Apple would like you to do. And then these are the other options. And this is what I feel is the most beneficial. And then you get an opportunity to make your own choices. So uh, Rob has presented a very strong case for visually impaired folks trying to navigate looking for your podcast episodes. And I'm advocating for the plain old listener Uh, especially from your back catalog and somebody who decides they want to consume a very specific episode of yours that you mention on a show, or when you want to bring awareness to one of your most favorite episodes. I was just listening back to my yoga podcasts, just because I was preparing for teaching yoga at She Podcasts Live Virtual. And I was just getting the vibe again of of my life back then. And I can very easily say, oh my gosh, you know, my class on episode 81 was really great. Class 81 was a really amazing class. If you want to practice with me that way, please go find it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, how easy is it for me to do that than say like, oh, it's a level this and that. It's this is the title of the, no, just go to class 81. Episode 81 was such a great class. You know, I, I covered that on episode 54. I taught this in that class, go do it. Because that's an evergreen, my Elsie's Yoga class is an evergreen podcast. So if somebody asks me, where should I start with your show? I can go, oh, start with episode this or this, right? And those are my classes that I can easily share. Anyway, let's move forward. Oh my God, that's a lot. So actually we have more Apple news. And Apple actually had a little news for podcasters and listeners that came out on June 20th. From Apple, quote, Apple improves podcast discovery by elevating nine subcategories and charts, unquote. This has to do with the search tab in Apple Podcast. If you tap on search, the tabs below the search bar have been updated. The tiles or tabs, whatever you want. To, I think Apple calls them tabs. They look like tiles. This is not, not about adding any new categories or subcategories to choose for your show. The nine they elevated are ones that have been available for you to choose for your show for years. It is just now they are moved up into the search screen and they are mental health, relationships, self-improvement, personal journals, entrepreneurship, documentary, parenting, which I guess is under now under politics, books, and language and learning. Did you really just say that? You said that. I did. I heard you. I you said that. I know it. They also had a tab for languages, which or tile for languages, where you can find curated recommendations for podcasts in different languages. And I thought this was really good because 
in the old days with Apple, you know, iTunes, it was really easy to change your language. Good luck trying to do that now in the Apple podcast app. So if you're bilingual and you want to go find podcasts in a different language, you know, you're here in the U.S., let's just read what Apple had to say. Sure. Quote, listeners in the U.S., U.K., Canada and Australia can also now explore podcasts by language to more easily find podcasts in their native language. Podcast by language features recommendations for some of the most popular languages in these markets with support for over 20 languages, including English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. For example, a U.S. listener can easily explore podcasts in Arabic, Chinese, French, and Spanish, while a U.K. Ex listener can explore podcasts in Dutch, Italian, and Portuguese. Select markets will feature an additional podcasts in English destination. Creators can specify the language for their podcast using Apple Podcast Connect or via RSS using their hosting provider, unquote. And this is where I want to point out that last part there. Select yeah. markets will feature additional podcasts in English destination. So before in other markets, English podcasts, i.e. people listening to this, most likely your podcast, was not as readily available. This will make it a little bit easier for people to find English podcasts, your podcast, in other languages. But conversely, if you are here in the U.S., again, if you are someone in the U.S. and you are bilingual and you, this is not where you grew up and your native language is one of the ones that was just mentioned, it now makes it easier for you to find podcasts in your native language to listen to for you to chill and relax. So anyway, it's a nice feature that Apple added. I'm really glad to see it because, again, it, it was easier in iTunes. To, you just go down to the bottom right and you could switch the country you were in and it would switch all the whole store around to that language that you wanted it to be. It's a much more difficult to do that in Apple Podcasts. You have to go into your Apple ID and there's a whole bunch of things you got to change and, gonna, and it's a pain to change it back and forth to different places. So anyway, a very welcome change. That's what I'd like to say. I'm actually going to claim this as my own personal win, Rob, <laughs> because I have been advocating for this for years, like years. And I really wish that I could go back to maybe recordings that I've done, particularly interviews that I've done, panels that I've been on. The Latino Podcast Listener Report is one of the biggest reasons why, you know, the advocacy for other languages and that data coming out and pushing this very specific conversation with as many people as would listen, especially for me, when I was thinking like, I cannot even find Spanish content. Like, how are we supposed to grow our audiences if you can't even search for that market? And being able to have that report to really display the amount of folks that are listening to content in different languages, it's it's seminal for being able to do this. So I'm claiming it as me because I started the conversation way back. Well, congr congratulations. With thank you so Vin much. for Elsie. <laughs> I'll take a bow. A and then, uh, yes. I was going to say, uh, by the way, this is not about iOS 17. This is about now. This is live. This is great. Yeah, I went mm -hmm. in this morning and looked and this was live. So, uh, yeah. This is now. I love this because and all and because now there are so many other experts and talented content creators have that have been creating content for these languages for other people who do not speak English. And now they get an opportunity to uh, advocate for that, because I know that when I first spoke with some of these folks who were creating content for other languages, I was like, you know, you can't search by language. Right. And they were like, what? Right. <laughs> and now it exists. Thank you, Apple. Thank you, Apple. Thank you, Apple. Yay. All right. And on that little note of joy, here we go uh, to another email. Hello, Elsie. Here's a link to my feedback on mic shipping. And mind you, this is from the incredible Liz Covart. This is a longer type of piece of feedback that we have going on. Um, but it's worth your time. And especially for folks who want to really invest in having that audio quality. So here we go. Take it away, Liz. Good generic time of the day, Elsie and Rob. This is Liz Covart of Ben Franklin's World. And I'm responding to the shout out I received in the last episode to talk about how we ship mics to guests. So back in 2017, 2018, whenever it is that Squadcast came out, we started shipping mics to guests. And part of this was our strategy because we wanted to have really high quality audio and we wanted that high quality audio to set us apart from a lot of history podcasts. 
And it did back then, and it still does today. Now, Rob, I heard you recommend the Samsung Q2U mic as a good mic that people could send out. I humbly disagree. As someone pointed out to me when I was doing my research on mics to ship out, why would you send a mic to people that require someone to know how to use a mic? So we sent out Sennheiser PC8 headset mics. This is so that the mic boom, like once it's set, it follows the guest no matter where they turn their head so that their voice is always going into the mic. So this helps us again with our audio quality. And the nice thing about the Sennheiser PC8s is unlike the Samsung Q2U, which as you pointed out, is a $60, $65 mic, the Sennheiser PC8s are really like a $25 mic. And this is important because we have found that we need at least six to 12 mics on hand at any given time because we're an interview-based show. And especially when we do those narrative episodes or the multi-interview episodes, we need to have multiple mics out and about to different guests and on their way back to us at different times. So we need to make that investment. If you're going to do this, if you're a weekly show, I would recommend getting 12 mics. If you are producing every other month, then you can probably get away with six mics. You also have to be aware that you're going to lose mics. We pay for shipping both ways. It costs us about $15 round trip from the U.S. Postal Service to ship mics. We choose the U.S. Postal Service because we want our guests to return the mics and it's easiest for them to put them out in their mailbox. They can do that anywhere they are. So that's why we use the United States Postal Service. Even though we do this and my assistant, Holly White, will include instructions of like how to put the mic back in the box put one piece of tape over the box and affix the prepaid mailing label over it. Although we provide those instruction to guests, some assume that we're gifting them the mic or they ghost us like they didn't do the interview and now they're kind of embarrassed about it. So they just ghost us and they never ship the mic back. Some of them have gotten lost in the mail. So as you make this investment, you have to know it's not a one-time investment. You're probably going to have to replace mics along the way. I would say we lose about two to three mics a year. Now, in terms of boxes, we did spec these out. We order them from Plastiform. We look at the 8x8x3.5 Easy Shipper anti-static foam boxes. So it has the foam in it. It's perfect for shipping electronics. For that, I ordered them last year and we paid $161.52 per case for the boxes with an additional $28 for shipping. So I'm going to include all that information in an email to Elsie and Rob with the hope that Elsie will put them in the show notes. We also include instructions for our guests to hook up the mic. Right now we're using Riverside.fm. We have instructions for Squadcast. So I'll send these along to Elsie so she can put them up on the show notes. So anybody can use our instructions if they'd like. We enjoy shipping mics to guests. It costs Holly time, my assistant Holly time. Like she has to package them up, put the instructions in and send them out. And then she has to receive the mics when she receives them. Holly has developed a neat little spreadsheet so she can keep track of what mics are in and out and who they were shipped to last. So if we ever do have to track down a mic, because sometimes people use them, and although, again, we put the prepaid label there, they don't actually return them right away. It'll sit on their desk. So every once in a while, Holly has to go down and track a mic, and so she knows where they are or where they were, and we can try to locate it from there. So that's something else you want to do. You want to be organized and, you know, number your mics and just keep track of who's getting what mic and where they're going so that you know about when to expect them back. So I think that's about it in terms of shipping mics. I'm happy to answer anybody's questions, Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, or you can leave Elsie and Rob feedback and I'll call back in and leave more voicemails. So thank you very much for your interest. I wish you all luck shipping out mics. I will say this was not something I approached until someone else was paying for my podcast. So I still owe my podcast. IP rights are important. But for the last six plus years now, I've had somebody else footing the podcast production bills. So these organizations agreed with me that shipping out mics was important for audio quality and they were willing to make the investment. If you're not really making money for your podcasts, I'm not sure I would recommend this strategy. But if you are making some money to support this investment, I think it's well worth it. I think everybody wants to hear podcasts that have great audio quality. I know I do. So this is one way you can level up that. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. All right, Liz, thank you for the feedback and the suggestions on the mic. As it is an eighth inch plug and not USB, I do wonder which laptops do not support uh, the mic input on the eighth inch input. Um, If a laptop has two eighth inch inputs, one for headphones and one for mic, 
that would need an adapter. Hopefully they would already have that adapter. Other issues um, that I, I, I concerned about with eighth inch headphones is the plug over time tends to fray or have connection issues um, as the plug uh, gets pulled in and out or someone drops a laptop on the plug uh, on the corner, you know, one of the TRRS connections can break um, or become intermittent and then get that staticky sound from older ones. So you should definitely be checking these headphones before you send them out to guests, especially if it's one previously sent to a guest. So you, you'd, you want to definitely do a quality check every time it comes back in. Uh, but at $25, it is definitely cheaper than the Q2U, which is typically $70, except during prime days when I've seen it drop down to as, in the low 40s for the Q2U. Speaking of which, Amazon Prime days are coming up July 11th and 12th this year. And sadly, 7-Eleven is not a prime number, nor is 117. Um, hmm. So neither in the US or Europe, Prime Day uh, is actually not a prime number. Just disappointing. They had picked July 9th, then 709 is a prime number. All right. They, they really need to get some well, they will never number do nerds. What you want. They will I know. never do they what do you want. They do not have number nerds in Amazon marketing. It, it, I'm just saying that. And I've said that every year and every year I get disappointed when I, I hear the date and I go and run and, and I ask Siri if it's a prime number and Siri goes, that is not a prime number. I'm like, oh, oh my God, really? I'm very sorry. And now I got to get on the feed and show my number nerdness and complain about it. <laughs> but again, I just want to shout out Liz again for sending that feedback. I thought that was very good, very thorough. And she's really thought it out. Um, and again, I guess another thing too is this is a lighter, you know, send, meaning the Q2U is a heavier microphone. It's a bulkier kind of box and whatnot. This is a headset thingy majigger that you're, ta you're sending over and it kind of, so yeah, that Sennheiser PC8 um, looks like something that you can definitely send out. Thank you, Liz. We've missed you. We've missed hearing your voice on the show. So thanks for reaching back out. All right. And so now we are getting to our very, no, not the very first, the second promo of the episode, Grounded in Maine. And Maine as in like M-A-I-N-E, folks. Grounded in Maine. Hi there. My name is Amy Fagan, and I want to talk for just a second about my sustainability podcast called Grounded in Maine Podcast. I'm passionate about sustainability, and I'm dedicated to promoting its importance through this weekly podcast. I'm a student of life, and I love learning about people's stories. Do you have a story about sustainability? I'm curious to learn about you, too. Please follow me on Instagram at Grounded in Maine Podcast and find my podcast wherever you listen. All right. Yay. All right. So we have another a little bit of feedback. Here we go. Quote, trailers were a big topic at She Podcast Live Virtual. Question, is there a way to keep my general show, not a special episode, trailer at the top of the episode lists when people are looking for new podcasts? I'm guessing it's something to do with the trailer slash bonus buttons and episode numbers. I look forward to hearing your response and I'm working on a new trailer, which I'll submit to for LC to queue up. Yay. And this is from Cheryl. All right, Cheryl. Thank you for that. And for serial content, the trailer episode for the show or the season will be up front in Apple Podcasts. So for serial content, no problem. For episodic content, not so much. However, mm. do make sure when publishing the trailer, you select the episode type as a trailer. This will not get it at the top, but it will put it right below the first eight episodes in Apple Podcasts. So when you go and browse through podcasts and tap on a podcast and scroll through that first tap screen, Apple cuts off after eight episodes. And then there is the trailer episode listed and it says trailer episode. And there's even a trailer episode section in, in Apple Podcasts. So you want to make sure you take the episode type and you select trailer. Um, so that will get it close to the top. But unfortunately, in Apple Podcasts, for episodic content, they do not put the trailer at the top. Mm -hmm. All right. And moving on here to another email. Quote, Elsie and Rob, I am the publisher of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. I use Alphonic.com to do audio leveling and noise reduction on my podcast. Alphonic just announced automatically generate show notes, summaries, and chapters from recording feature. My first question is, what the heck are chapter marks? 
I have never listened to a podcast with chapter marks that I know of. I listen to podcasts on Apple Podcast, and it is my understanding that it does support chapter marks, but I have not seen any. Why would I use chapter marks? My second question is around show notes. I'm publishing episode 325 next week, which means I've been publishing for six and a half years. When I started, I hired someone to write detailed show notes. I surveyed my audience several years ago, and very few people read the show notes. The ones that said that they read the show notes said that they only read them for the links and resources mentioned in the episode. In general, I do not read show notes except for resources. Your podcast is one of the few podcasts that I read the show notes on because I fast forward to sections that are of interest to me and skip over what is not. Okay, and this is where your question of chapter (laughs) marks comes into play. (laughs) Chapter marks are a way of allowing your audience to skip over sections of your podcast that you toiled and sweat over, but the listener had no appreciation for. And just like that, they can jump over that well thought out and insightful as well as witty and humorous segment with a single tap. That is what chapter marks are for. There are also for regretting you ever started spending time adding them in, as in the extra time you could be sleeping. And now a few militant listeners will not let you stop adding in chapter marks and complain loudly and often when you try to no longer include them with your show. So, yeah, that sums up chapter marks nicely. So thank you for the segue into answering your own question. Okay, you can go back to the. (laughs) Okay. Uh, But I'm going to follow up with a little bit more, but let's continue on here. Okay, so here's more of the email. I cut back on my show notes production to just having an introduction to the podcast episode, the bio of the person I was interviewing and the links and resources. I tried to use a phonic transcription and the summary description generated from the transcription. But as I expected, it was more work to edit it than I wanted to do. I have always heard that SEO is not how people discover podcasts. What am I missing here? And this is from Mark. Repurpose your career podcast okay. from Career Pivot. All right. So do you want to talk about chapter marks? Or you want me to talk about SEO? Let's go ahead and let me really quickly talk about chapter marks for Mark. So Mark, obviously, we were very humorous in, in bringing that to your attention. And now in the show notes, you can see the time codes, right? So Time codes are almost exactly what chapter marks are like. With the time codes, you can look through our show notes, whether you're consuming them on the website or not, and be able to play the play button inside of the player, like on the website, let's say, or maybe on a podcast player, you open it up and you like scroll to what I say, you know, start here at 15 minutes. You can use your little finger to move it and then you can start listening. Great. Now, chapter marks, instead of you using your finger, there's a little sort of move forward play button usually located either within the artwork portion. There's like a little tiny triangle, like less than minus Mm -hmm. that, like less than uh, minus whatever those little marks on the sides. Or you can do that from the player itself or you can tap it and it automatically goes to the next section. So whenever you see the time codes, every time code is a chapter mark. So you can tap it and it just moves forward. Same thing happens inside of YouTube. Now that we're, you know, putting this stuff on YouTube, the chapter marks that I have in there, in quote, the time codes, they're translated into chapter marks inside of YouTube. So if you look at the show description inside of our YouTube video and you just tap on the time code, it actually jumps to that section inside of the show. So it, it actually helps you do what you're already doing instead of with your finger. And here's the other fun part. Let's say you want to go back. You're like, oh, I really want to go back to the other part or listen to it again. You just have to press back just one thing and you'll go all the way back. So it is a really, really wonderful way to do it. That's why I love chapter marks. And it's also really great for uh, sharing specific segments of your show, even from directly in Apple, uh, either Apple Podcasts or Overcast or any of those things. I believe they support sharing directly from a time code as well as YouTube videos. So all of that stuff is incredibly helpful. I may be wrong about Apple Podcasts, so Mm -hmm. please school me if that's not the case. But go ahead, go ahead, do your SEO. All right, so per SEO... I know there's a few people going, oh, no, SEO is uh, discovery. But anyway, um, 
that is what the transcription re- is really for. You put it out as a post on your blog. While some will make the transcription, uh, the show notes, that is not where it's best used. It's better to create a blog post that does not go into your main RSS feed and put the transcription for the episode there in hopes of getting some SEO love from Google. You can do this easily in Lipson 4 UI. You can do a text-only post in Lipson 4 UI. Eventually, that'll be in Lipson 5. But you can do that in the Lipson 4 UI where you have this blog post. And by the way, Lipson um, websites get great SEO. Per how effective show notes are in bringing in listeners, that's another debate altogether. And I don't want to get into that here because I could take up a whole episode. But I will just say for some shows, it helps. For others, maybe not. Either way, if you do put out your transcription on its own page, the biggest mistake people make is not putting a player with the episode, that episode at the top. I've seen this multiple times. I don't get it. People go through all the time to do this SEO stuff, and then they don't put the player at the top of the page. Put the player at the top of the page so when someone finds the page, they can click play. Also, not putting in buttons to subscribe to the podcast right below the player for Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and other top aggregator apps. What are you thinking? You're wasting all this SEO work and not getting the return that you're hoping for, right? So after all, if the SEO does work for you, once someone lands on your page, you need to make it one, easy for them to listen to that episode, and two, easy to subscribe, follow your podcast on the aggregator app of their choice. The point is, make it easy for people to consume the content once they find your podcast and make it easy for them to subscribe, follow. So there. I'm not going to add anything because I could also talk about this all day, every day. So hopefully this will help you. And if anybody has any other questions around all of this, or maybe you want our thoughts, maybe on every episode, we'll drop a little something, something about our thoughts around show notes and SEO. Send us some feedback over to the feed at Lipson.com and ask us questions and we will continue talking about it. So a new podcast launching this week. It is called Blah, Blah, Blah with Katie Sackoff. Yes, that is correct. The actress behind Starbuck, Bo-Katan, live and animated, Poison Ivy, animated, and so many other live and voice appearances uh, is going to have her own podcast. Woohoo! And actually, here's a promo. Hey, everyone. This is Blah, 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 the podcast feed with Katie Sackoff and my friend... Me, Christian Harloff. Hey, man. I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> this is our like first intro to yeah. sit down and be like, hey, guys, we're here. This is a podcast. Come find us. Blah, 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 blah. Nice. See, by the way, we, we talked about that. People, I, Katie put out this video explaining that we were doing a podcast and that she was excited to do it and the real conversation that she was going to have. And we went back and forth in this title. People love the title, by the way. They do lo- they? Oh, blah, they blah, blah. It. They love it. I and I love it not only that, I say blah, blah, blah all the time. You do. And I hate to do this, guys, but we're going to have to run because we have a guest that just showed up. Oh, and yeah. so we've got to go actually make an episode. Yes. So come back here. Subscribe to this feed soon. if you haven't done it already. Yeah, do it. Find us wherever podcasts are. I don't know where you're listening or whatever, but hello. Welcome. We'll be here every week. What a cool way to be interrupted on this thing. All right. We'll see you soon. This is it. This is just bye. Bye, 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 bye. Very excited. The nerds in my family are very excited. Um, my son, huge Star Wars fan. And Fan, he's seen every episode of Clone Wars and Rebels, and she was there as the voice in that. And then, of course, she was in Mandalorian this last season. She was really the focus, really, of the last yeah. season. But anyway, very excited to have that. And I've talked with people that have talked with Katie personally, podcasters, and she's been re- really, really generous with her time for podcasters. So it's great to see that she now has her own podcast and it's hosted Yay. with us and launching this week. Um, so Definitely check that one out. Fantastic. Love, love, love that. Okay. And now moving on to a little story. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Bill, yeah. Oh, my God. Go so, so Bill Simmons um, from The Ringer that, that was then acquired by Spotify and is at Spotify and head of content there. And he had some choice words for Prince Harry and Meghan, calling them <laughs> expletive grifters. And I saw some people taking serious issue with his comments and calling him out. And I would like to say, I understand why he would say that. I mean, they were paid millions, many, many, many millions for basically no real content of any substance, while at the same time, he is watching 25% of the employees in Spotify's podcast team get let go. So of course he's upset with them, and rightly so. I mean, 
how many good people were let go because Prince Harry and Meghan's lack of work on creating content? That is the question Bill was likely asking and what caused him to boil over multiple times. <laughs> that said, he should also be mad at the people that were crazy enough to pay them all that money without putting in place some guarantees on content output and audience download number requirements. And I mean, it was just a bad, bad deal all around. But again, not an indication of anything wrong in podcasting, just a bad deal. But I mean, don't beat up Bill for his frustration because he had to watch friends get laid off. I mean, that that's really what I see it as. And, and I completely understand why he would make those comments. I think we also have to, uh, in terms of calling it out too, right? Because Bill Simmons' deal with Spotify also added a uh, aspect, which was he he is part of the executive team over at Spotify, so there is a vested interest in him as well. So that there and and as a leader of a company or somebody who is involved within the inner workings of a large company, what Rob said, absolutely, it's not a random person who is doing a show for Spotify and he's mad, right? It's not that. He is part of Spotify. I mean, literally, as in part of this executive team. I think that, you know, taking sort of Harry and Meghan or making them, I guess, a representative of the celebrity. Let's just put that like the celebrity podcast in here. I think that this is a really great wake up call for celebrities that one of the reasons that I do believe that this happened is the fact that there are, mind you, Harry and Megan have never really been content creators. Megan was an actor and maybe she'll continue doing that. I don't believe Harry has ever really been a content creator. He did write a book. That's a thing. Being a content creator, I'm not saying an actor or a, you know, a singer, musician and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm saying Ones that get behind the microphone, behind a, you know, taking pictures, behind a photos, uh, camera, things like that on the daily and creating content. It's your job. It's a lot of work. There are many podcasters out there who are actually making money from their podcast and their content. And that's what they do all day. They create content. They record shows. They're behind a camera. They are recording their audio. They're making Instagram reels. They're taking beautiful shots. They're doing Instagram lives. They're doing Twitch streams. They're, do, you know, there's so many things that content creators do. And if they got whatever X amount of million dollars, they'd be doing the output because they are used to doing the work. Now, if you get a celebrity coming into the scene, getting all these millions of dollars, and they don't know how to create content, as in like, just create it. Like, and you even have a team. People are helping you. Mm -hmm. It's your job. This is what you do. You create content. You go to work, you create content. What's the next thing? It is a heavy lift, even if you are the talent and even if you have a team, because you are the one that's crafting the vision for all of this stuff. And particularly nowadays, content creation is unbelievably individual. As in like, you are why people watch. You are why people watch. He's Prince Harry. His his mother was Princess Diana. His father may have right. been King Charles. That's why they're there. Yep. And hence, I would be curious if they were putting this stuff out there, meaning they were doing some Instagram stuff. They were doing some behind the scenes things. They were recording their own conversations at home. They're, you know, the quality meaning as in like, does it have to be highly edited, highly narrative, highly all the things? Not really. I think that there's a lot of folks that would have been very happy to just have Harry and Meghan turn on and do a couple cast. <laughs> you know I, mean? I mean, and have maybe their PR team kind of trim the bits that maybe should not have been going out there and doing a weekly show like that. Just having them do that would be amazing. But you know what that takes? It takes you waking up at 830 in the morning, <laughs> recording and doing it or, you know, making sure that you do it when you don't want to and you're exhausted. Like, you know, some of us, we don't want to record sometimes, but we do it because we're committed and there's a reason why we're doing this. So I think it really calls attention to you got to be a content creator to want to be a podcaster because it's not an easy job, even with a team. And even with millions and millions of dollars, it doesn't Correct. make content creation any easier. Nope. Nope. So that's my take on that. But all right, moving on here, we're going to be moving to a little bit of data from Edison Research that was presented at She Podcast Live. 
Uh, Laura Ivy came in and did a keynote, and this was She Podcast for Live Virtual. The way that uh, this data is presented at She Podcast Live, it's a compilation of data from a lot of the different reports and surveys and data inputs or that Edison does through the year and with other partners. So there was a compilation of the data where the centering or the representation of the data uh, was very much about women because that's what they were Mm -hmm. focusing on. So um, one of the key things that I don't think I've seen anywhere, and I've only seen it presented one other time at She Podcast Live 2021, which was in Arizona, and she had this again, was a showing of the top 10 podcasts based on the US that were broken down by gender. Uh, Rob, should we talk about what the top were here? Yeah, yeah. I think this is actually... I was very surprised by this. So, you know, the the first list is women age 13 plus, And then the other list for top 10 is men age 13 plus. Number one for women, not surprising, um, crime junkie. Right? So true crime podcast. Uh, number three is morbid, also a true crime podcast. But number two surprised me, Joe Rogan. I would not have guessed Joe Rogan would have been in the top 10 for women, but he is. Yeah. And that is very surprising. Now, he is obviously number one for men ages 13 plus. But the Daily also did very well. The Daily is number two for men and number four for women. Yep. Both those shows clearly doing very well across all genders. Not surprising on, on some of the others in the top 10. You know, Office Ladies was number 10 in that list. Uh, it was nice to see that one in there. Call Her Daddy was number five. And again, that's restricted to just being on Spotify. I know. And that's a really surprise. Mind you, Call Her Daddy, I believe, was not there on the 2025. So she has actually really popped up there. Mm -hmm. So that's very admirable. Kudos to you, Alexander Cooper, for making yourself... Because again, it's exclusive, right? And she's not as, in quote, big as uh, Joe Rogan Mm -hmm. for that. So yeah, yeah. My Favorite Murder is up there, uh, number eight on there. So, you know, it's nice to see Crime Junkie, Morbid, My Favorite Murder, Office Ladies in there, Call Her Daddy. Then there's some big branded ones um, for women. Uh, Dateline was number six. Uh, This American Life, number seven. Stuff You Should Know, number nine. Yeah, I think the Joe Rogan one that really surprised me and for women there. The men one, Crime Junkie at number five actually surprised me and Morbid as number nine. I didn't think uh, True Crime Podcast would be in the top of, of the men podcasts. Yeah. And also you have like this, uh, the group of the, I've never actually heard of these other ones, number seven and number eight, which are Impulsive and Two Bears and One Cave. Two Bears, One Cave is um, Tom Segura and Burt Crusher. And um, Impulsive is one of the Paul brothers. So those podcasts actually both started with Libsyn. So both of those podcasts were on Libsyn originally. Yeah. Yeah. So and then we have Ben Shapiro for the men at number four and Smartless is number 10, which wait, but well, they're not exclusive. I thought they were exclusive to Amazon, but they're not right. They're like they're just exclusive as in like coming. They come early. It, it, it's released early on Amazon Music and then it's available everywhere else. Really, the only yeah. ones that I, I know of that are exclusive on this list are Rogan and, and Call Her Daddy. Yeah. Absolutely. I do see that there's, I mean, even when looking at that, obviously the hosts for the women are leaning toward being women's voices. I'm just calling out that usually women like to listen to women. How about that? Mm-hmm. We can do that. We are, There's more data around that as well within the, if you want to see the entire data set, please feel free to do that. The presentation by Laura gives a lot more context to these findings, where they came from and all of that stuff. Just to say that these are the top 10 podcasts based on US reach. Okay, so it's very specific. But it's it was really eye opening also for us to look at and see that Joe Rogan is number two, just because that really speaks to the size of the volume, right, mm-hmm. of listenership mm-hmm. to the Rogan show, right, in terms of the expansiveness of what that does for both sides, and it and it's to the same thing, Crime Junkie, right? Crime Junkie has that same sort of appeal which you're talking about as well, that you were thinking like, oh my gosh, I didn't know them that it would fall into the men. But being an un- under number five slot for men 13 plus, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So we have in the top 10 for men, there are at least from what I can at this top side, like women led, it would be crime junkie and morbid. That's something to just to note that there are some women's voices in the top 10 for men as well. Yeah. Anyway, if you want any more of this information, please sign up for the She Podcast Live virtual ticket and and you'll be able to see 
very specifically, particularly for you, if you happen to be a woman podcaster, to see the data, to look at it from this perspective. There's a lot of really interesting stuff. Coming in here just for a quick little update. I mentioned that the virtual ticket for She Podcast Live was still available. Maybe by the time you read this, it will be. If it is, it will be in the show notes. But if it's not, it's because it's not available. So I want to make sure that I'm clear about that. There may or may not be availability to get the She Podcast virtual tickets. Sorry about that. So half of the top 10 podcasts for women are hosted by women and 20% of the male ones are hosted by women. Okay. It's good. So we need, we need more ones hosted by women in the top 10 for women and men for that matter. Yeah. But it's just something to note mm-hmm. and to be able to look at. We've got our third promo here. Yes. Another, this is a woman led podcast for sure. And she has been a friend of the feed for so long. Uh, let's go ahead and hear from Childless Not by Choice. Hello there, the feed listeners. It's Savella Morgan, founder and host of the Childless Not by Choice podcast. Well, July 2023 will mark eight years of podcasting to, for, and about the Childless Not by Choice experience. I've cried as I've watched episodes go up in flames due to tech issues, changed my mind about certain guests, and pinched myself when other guests said yes. I've been primary caregiver for both parents while working full-time and sometimes not working at all. I've lost one parent and wondered if I should continue on. I've heard from listeners who were at the end of their rope until they heard my podcast. And I responded to people who took great risk in reaching out to me. I am humbled. Thank you so much to the feed for everything you do because you are a big part of how I do things. Thanks to all of the Childless Not By Choice listeners. And if you haven't listened yet, now's as good a time as any to eight more years. Cheers. Savella, thank you so much for sending in the recording and congrats on eight years podcasting and, and, and good luck with the next eight years. Yes, congrats, Savilla. It's been such a pleasure to see you grow so much and, and to be for you to be so transparent about, you know, again, podcasting is not easy, Harry and Megan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you gotta really want it. Okay. Um, go ahead, Rob. It is your time to take it to stats. All right. So first up is country breakdown for May per downloads geographically from all sources. US was 64%, 5.4% for Canada, UK at 5%. Australia at 3.7, Germany at 2.5, Sweden at 1.6. That's everybody over 1%. Those others rounding out the top 20 in order are Japan, Spain, Mexico, India, France, Netherlands, Brazil, Denmark, New Zealand, Iran, South Africa, Colombia, Ireland, and Switzerland. We had the same top 20 for May as we had in April. But between May and April, those with changes greater than 0.2% was the U.S. moving down to 64 from 64.3, so barely just 0.3% drop, not not much. Of course, check your stats and see how you measure up to these numbers for May. And now for user agent part of stats. Uh, For May, across all shows globally hosting on Libsyn and Libsyn Pro for IEB stats, mobile downloads were at 92.85% of all downloads going directly to a mobile device. That is down a smidge of a smidge from April's 92.87%, basically the same. Computer downloads were also basically unchanged at 6.86%. Home voice attendance plus set-top boxes, i.e. Alexa and those things, 0.29% in May. iOS to Android ratio in May was 5.5 to 1. That's down a smidge from April's 5.6 to 1. And then mobile aggregator apps not from Spotify or from Apple in May were 10.56% for all downloads, and that's up a smidge from 10.21 in April. And the big dog in aggregator apps is still Apple, with Apple Podcasts app and iTunes and the Apple ecosystem coming in at 65.5% of all downloads in May. Number two for May was Spotify with 15.8%. Number three was Google Podcast at 2.3, Overcast at 1.6, and that was everyone over 1%. Those under 1% in order, Pocket Cast, CastBox, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Podbean, the podcast app, Amazon Music, and Podcast Attic. Those, that gets us to now everything from this point below is 0.2% or lower. And now we go Player FM, 
Podcast Republic, Downcast, Antenna Pod, Rezo, Evox, TuneIn Radio, Pandora, Deezer, Podomo, Fountain, Samsung Podcasts, Castro, iCatcher, Podkicker, Mixerbox, RSS Radio, and Podcast Guru. And then many, many more that come under 0.02% and don't really warrant mention yet. Again, those were based on IAB numbers. Now, outside of aggregator apps, there were browsers. Chrome was 3.2%. Safari came in at 1.3%. Mozilla, 0.5%. And Firefox at 03 Overall, all browsers combined were just around 5.5% of downloads. Once again, if you see a show with over 10,000 downloads a month combined, and more than, say, 10% is from browsers, you might want to really question some of the things going on with that show. Typically speaking, the higher the total number of downloads for a show, the lower the percentage is for or should be for browsers. Typically speaking, that's what we see. Just a sanity check before you trust somebody's numbers or even question your own numbers. All right. And um, where have we been? Well, let us say I was at She Podcast Live Virtual, like I mentioned before, and it was an amazing, amazing event all the way around. It was really, really, uh, uh, the caliber of the speakers is incredible, really. And I'm not just saying that because <laughs> I was part of it. I had, because I had to sit there and watch everybody's presentations. <laughs> and it was so good. We had the Copyright Alliance for the very first time presenting to podcasters. You can find those guys over at copyrightalliance.org, I believe is the website. And they broke down fair use copyright and everything that is it, it they were really an astounding astounding both of them were counsel that have worked and have a lot of experience so uh just even that alone i mean i'm telling you the amount of information that was there is just it was so great so that's where i have been i'm going to keep it at that and there's a couple of new uh youtube videos to check out actually rob i believe by the time this goes live if not already the very first time we're going to be sharing a snippet from episode 245, where we talk about iOS 17. So this is going to be a test post of me introducing a segment for episode 245, which is all about iOS 17 and what we need to what we're expecting. And with, so I'm on camera for like a few seconds at the beginning, a few seconds at the end. And the middle part is audiogram of a piece of our show. So we'll see how that does. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be putting that out there in case anybody wants to reference back to all of the things that Apple just released about iOS 17. So I'll put a link in the show notes if it's already out. And where are we going, Rob? Where have I been and where I'm going is kind of a, from my perspective, recording is where I'm going. And by the time you hear this, it's where have I been. And that's... um. This weekend in Nashville, Christopher Titus is in doing a comedy show, and uh, he was generous enough to get me and my wife tickets to his comedy show. So I will be going to the Christopher Titus event at the uh, Zanies Comedy Club. So I'm, I'm going to go see his set at Zanies. So I'm excited. I haven't really been out to comedy clubs since I've moved here to um, Nashville. So I, I need to get back going to the comedy clubs again. And, and I saw Christopher was coming in and he was generous enough to get me and my wife tickets. So I'm looking forward for taking the wife out on a date. And I don't know if she, she knows what she's in for yet. But <laughs> but if, if you haven't checked out Christopher Sidus's podcast, it's really good. So um, please do. Podcast Movement in Denver, August 21st to 24th. Need to buy my tickets, uh, airplane tickets. I got to get that taken care of. Time to get your tickets, folks. Um, I'll be speaking. Uh, more information about that coming up. Uh, we have a few other places going in 2023. We'll mention those as we get closer. Folks, uh, check your calendars, block off uh, those dates in August for Podcast Movement. And if you're looking for a job in podcasting, make sure you go to podcastingjobs.com. As of the uh, end of here or the middle of June, end of June, uh, we had five openings listed there. Don't forget to send in your feedback for anything we did or did not mention on this episode. You can record that feedback and email it to us, thefeed at lipson.com, or you can call us at 412-573-1934, or you can use SpeakPipe at speakpipe.com slash thefeed. Woohoo! Yay, yay, yay. Of course, we'd love that. And just really quickly, I forgot to even write this in the show notes. I'm also speaking at Podcast Movement, so do take your get your tickets right away. And we will chat with you in a couple of weeks with more details. All right. Bye. Oh.